I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to our Advanced Level 2 Natural Area Management Services webinar. Starting off with uh, Wildlife Week here, it's a presentation of the Woods in Your Backyard Partnership. That's a cooperative effort with the University of Maryland Extension, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Penn State Extension, and the Virginia Department of Forestry. Funding for this webinar series was made possible in part by a grant from the Harry R. Hughes Center for Agroecology at the University of Maryland. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about what we're gonna be doing for the next four weeks, Tuesdays and Thursday nights here on the internet. Tonight, we're going to start Wildlife Week, creating enhancing wildlife habitat, and then Thursday night, dealing with uninvited guests, addressing wildlife conflicts. Week two is March 2nd and March 4th, and then week three is March 9th and March 11th. And then week four, vegetation management week, wrapping up the series March 16th and 18th. And the only difference between week three and week four, of course, is that daylight, daylight savings time begins on March 14th. So you wanna make sure that you have your clocks adjusted so that when you come back Tuesday night, March 16th, you're here on Eastern Daylight Time. Now, tonight's webinar is creating and enhancing wildlife habitat. Talk a little bit about what we're gonna be doing tonight. Creating or enhancing habitat attracts wildlife. It's the, you know, the, the field of dream syndrome, build it and they will come. Now, this presentation will provide detailed instruction on specific practices to create and enhance wildlife habitat. This includes creating soft edges, snags, brush piles, and other practices from the Woodland Health Practices Handbook. Now I understand not everyone has gotten theirs yet, but when you get that, you'll be able to see all the different things that, that we talk about. And it's, there's a wide variety of land care practices that, uh, that are available. Uh, tonight, we'll also address specific habitat management practices and how they're applied to different woodland successional stages. But before we get started, we've got a little bit of housekeeping to take care of. First off, let me welcome everyone tonight. Uh, if you're new to the woodland, the Woods Near Backyard Partnership programs, welcome. Uh, if you were with us last fall, thank you for coming back. My name is Andrew Kling. I'm with the Woodland Stewardship Education Program of the University of Maryland Extension. And working behind the scenes with me tonight is Agnes Kedmanes, also with the Woodland Stewardship Education Program. There she is waving hello. We wanna thank you for registering and thank you for coming back if you're, if you're rejoining us. Uh, we've had uh, a really nice response to, to this series. So we hope that we can provide a lot of interesting information. Now we do wanna let you know that this is being recorded. We are uh, recording tonight. All of our webinars are recorded and we need to let you know that for legal purposes and by staying on, you're giving us permission to to uh, access the, the chat room and the Q&A information that you share. And we just wanna let you know, so you're comfortable with that. Now the recording will be available later on. If you wanna go back and review it later, you wanna share it with other folks. Uh, it'll be available through our website. That's extension.umd.edu slash woodland. And what I'll do is I'll send out an email to everyone, to all the participants and the folks in Pennsylvania will send it out to people who registered through them and the same with the folks who registered through Virginia. So you'll know how to access the, the recording through our YouTube channel via our website, let you know where everything is. Now, you can also acquire continuing education credits by joining us for this webinar series, but only if you join us live. Uh, unfortunately, the associations say they don't give out continuing education credits if you watch the recording. You have to be here live to get the credits. And so what will happen is we take the Zoom attendance report, we match that to the people who registered, and we send out a, we send out a certificate to those folks who provided their email. And you then fill it out and send it out to the association you, you work with, ISA, SAF, licensed tree experts, et cetera. And then they'll give you the credits that, uh, that they've associated with this webinar. We heartily in, encourage you to join us in talking about all the different things that we're gonna be talking about. And there's two ways to do that. One is through the chat 
uh, through the chat screen and the other is through the Q&A function. The chat screen, the chat box is more of a discussion thing, something that, that piques your interest, you wanna share it with people. And the Q&A is mostly for the questions that uh, the presenters are, are going to be addressing. And we usually use the last 30 minutes, the eight to 8.30 block for questions and answers. So we'll have plenty of time to do that after the uh, presentations are over. And we do have folks from the Woods in Your Backyard Partnership joining us tonight. Uh, they'll be listening in and sharing views. They'll be able to answer questions that come up and, and share information. And if someone says, oh, this is an interesting website, they can add that too. So make sure you take a look at all of that as we're going along. And I know this is the first evening of, of eight, of four weeks, but I wanna put this in the back of your mind so you can think about it as, as we go along. We'll be sending out an evaluation for this webinar series. We'll send it out within a week of the final session on March 18th. And for those of you who joined us last fall, we, we really appreciated your feedback because that really helped us develop what we're gonna be doing over the next four weeks. And for those of you who are new, Give us your feedback. Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you learned, what you can use in, uh, in your business. And the great thing about that is it helps us develop programming going into the future. Let us know if we're uh, doing the right thing. Uh, if you want to see more webinars, if you want to be interested more in doing face-to-face -face workshops when we can get back to doing that, all of that feedback is very important to us. So before we turn things over to our two speakers tonight, I'd like to tell you a little bit about both Luke and Calvin. Luke McCauley is a wildlife management specialist from the University of Maryland Extension. And Calvin Norman is a forestry and wildlife extension educator from Penn State. Now, Luke's extension program provides educational information to a variety of groups and stakeholders, including wildlife enthusiasts and naturalists, people experiencing issues with wildlife damage and folks managing game for hunting. Luke earned his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Calvin, as I said, is a forestry and wildlife extension educator for Penn State. He has a background in forestry and wildlife management, and he is passionate about managing land with wildlife in mind. He has a master's from Clemson University. Now, Luke is going to be running all of the, all of the show here tonight, right, Luke? That's, that's the plan. Okay, so what I am going to do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I will turn off my video and I will share my screen and you can take it away. Great, and let me start it at the beginning. We don't want to start the presentation. All right, can everybody see it? Any nods from my fellow panelists? Looks good to me. Looking good, great. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is my one of my first presentations in, in this position. I've been with University of Maryland Extension for only about six months. So it's a newly created presentation, um, hot off the presses. And um, yes, I agree with Andrew. Please do let us know what you like about it, if you had any suggestions for improving it. So um, with no further ado, let's get started. Um, here's the outline of what we'd like to cover today. Um, we're going to start out. I'll I'll cover me and Calvin. Are, we'll cover both of these items, all these items. But um, I'll start out and talk about what is wildlife, what is habitat, thinking about goals for your property. Uh, Calvin will take over and, and cover the bulk of the vegetation management section, which is a big part of what um, we can do for wildlife um, habitat improvement. And we'll talk a little bit about animal management practices that you could do to improve wildlife habitat. And finally, have a section on habitat loss and human dis disturbance and other aspects that can really affect wildlife. So as an introduction, um, I think the question of what is wildlife is, I always like to start at the basic definitions. And I think most people will agree that deer are probably the most iconic uh, species they think about when they think of wildlife. They probably also agree when they see something like a snapping turtle or frogs that these are also different types of wildlife species, but very different. Um, when you, um, reptiles and amphibians, we call herp tiles or herps, um, that group when you put both of those together, although they are very distinct. Uh, birds, certainly I think many of us think of uh, ducks, waterfowl, songbirds, definitely fit in the wildlife category. But then we start getting into some of these other ones where fish, 
crabs, are those wildlife? Well, they could be in a lot of places they do agree they are. Then you think, well, what about invertebrates? Are mussels counted as wildlife? Are insects counted as wildlife? Uh, monarch butterflies, thousands and thousands of species of insects and spiders um, around the world, are those wildlife? Well, the definitions, as you can guess, are very, they vary depending on your source, and they are very broad. Um, Merriam-Webster is one of the dictionaries I like to use, and it, it doesn't even limit it to animals. It says living things, especially birds, mammals, and fishes, but it leaves out reptiles and amphibians in that definition. So, um, but generally, many of us think about, uh, who work in wildlife, for my own, my own work, I, I generally think of ter terrestrial vertebrates, um, which is uh, what we'll focus on today, but, um, do want to keep a note for the other one. So we have these broad categories to help kind of condense these very broad types of wildlife into to categories that, we, that are a little bit more manageable. So we have mammals, I mentioned herps, reptiles and amphibians, birds, fish, and you have your invertebrates to sort of catch all of, of many different species. So the big reason I wanted to start with this, this picture and this slideshow is to think that, to emphasize that wildlife are very diverse. And as a result, the management practices are also can be very diverse. So um, we've now covered a little bit of what is wildlife. Now we'll get into what is habitat. So habitat, um, the Endangered Species Act recently um, had a new revision to the definition of habitat. And this is for endangered species. And it's just defined here as the abiotic and biotic setting that currently or periodically contains the resources and conditions necessary to support one or more life processes of a species. I have this picture here from the Woods in Your Backyards um, pamphlet to, to say this, this is really good habitat for a lot of things and we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. So when they talk about abiotic and biotic factors, um, just to give a broad overview of everything, um, these physiographic provinces provide a good overview, especially of a lot of the abiotic factors. So most people on this call, I expect, are from the Eastern coast. And we have these five physiographic provinces. And they vary a lot by their geology and what they call geomorphology, how water moves through the system, the underlying rock and topography, the temperature, precipitation, and hydrology. These are considered abiotic factors. They're, they're, not, they're not living. They're aspects of the environment that are um, biotic means life. And so their A is not, so it's not living factors versus the biotic factors where you can have plants, fungi, other living animals and the interactions of what's living in the environment also can drive what else can live there. So, but a very easy, quick, standard way that many of us think about habitat, it covers four main items. So food is number one. Um, and as I have this picture on here, it's a satellite imagery of an area in Maryland. And you see a lot of crops, some forest stands, wetlands, and a variety of uh, water courses and things. So we have uh, certainly food is being provided and what's growing on the ground. Cover in the forests, water in these creeks and waterways, ponds, vernal pools and space, uh, a place where, where all these things can fit that's sufficient for the wildlife species. So we call it, talks about wildlife and what, what is habitat. Now, I think one of the most important things I, I like to have early on in any presentation is, is a topic on goals, because just as wildlife are very diverse, people's goals are very diverse. Um, and it very much, um, there are a couple of ways to think about this. And I, I was thinking about how to break this down. And I think the scale is really a good way to think about this in terms of spatial scale, which is um, the size of your property that you're dealing with, the home range of the wildlife species you might be interested in attracting, attracting migratory routes and whether these species are even present in your area. Temporal scale, again, these are all very kind of technical terms, but these are good things to think about. What is the timeline that we're thinking about to improve wildlife habitat? Habitat can take from anywhere from a few, actually a few days for germination of certain species of, uh, of seeds to months on up to decades uh, and longer to develop uh, in terms of old growth forestry habitats. 
So, and another thing I'll, I'll emphasize and I'll, you'll see it come back around is what happens to the property after the current ownership, after the person who's currently managing for wildlife habitat, what happens after they, they move on, they sell the property or whatever. Um, one good place to start in terms of coming up with goals when we think about these scale issues, but we can also look towards a good place to go um, are the state wildlife action plans. Almost all states, I believe all 50 states have one of these and it was contingent for receiving federal funds. But there's on this table on the right, they have these broad conservation action categories. Um, and there's a variety of things such as planning, data collection, education, law and policy, but also there's this category of direct management of natural resources. And that's, that's what we, is a good place where we'll focus on today. Um, this comes from Maryland's State Wildlife Action Plan. And they, we pulled out a few that, that we're gonna cover um, today in terms of, and a lot of the ones in green are the vegetation management sections that Calvin's gonna cover here in a second. And the one in blue is the population management. We'll talk a little bit about that too. But um, each of these, so creating new habitat, invasive species control, um, water or vegetation management, native species, reintroduction and restoration. And finally, if you need to actually manage the populations themselves of certain wildlife species. And if you haven't, um, if I haven't emphasized it enough yet, but um, again, the effectiveness of this direct management activities, this is from the Pennsylvania State Wildlife Action Plan. And the light blue, this chart's a little bit confusing, but it's not too bad. I'm just gonna focus on this light blue section. And this is the, the number of species in each of these broad categories, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and fish. And how much, how many species in their state wildlife action plan can be improved or helped through direct management of natural resources. So you have certain species or groups of species that tend to respond more favorably to action than others. Um, and amphibians doesn't have any on there, but I do think there are some probably some activities you could do for amphibians. So also different subgroups within one of the, so birds we saw have a certain types of activities, but even within birds, you have different groups like grassland birds, forest birds, arid land birds. And I put this uh, graph up here just to emphasize that a lot of us think about forest birds, but also grassland birds are ones that have been um, declining the most over the last several decades. Um, and again, every species can have its own um, aspects uh, that have its own needs uh, for habitat. So uh, pileated woodpeckers, for example, this is this iconic woodpecker on the left, um, one of the largest woodpecker species in the, on the continent. Um, really relies on large expanses of uh, forests, uh, interior forest bird species. Whereas you have the savanna sparrow in the middle that relies on grassland habitat and the wood duck, which probably overlaps in some extent where there are wetlands where pileated woodpeckers are, but it has a separate requirement for water resources that pileated woodpeckers aren't as dependent on. So, with that, I, the big takeaway for the goal section is to really think about what are the species you're interested in and, and, and think about how you can um, take action for those species. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Calvin. He's gonna cover vegetation management. Thanks, Luke. All right. Okay, so uh, as Luke said, we're talking a lot about vegetation today. Um, so, most of what I'm talking about is more like uh, general diversity. And, you know, if your landowner just has a goal of seeing wildlife and if they're not keyed on anything super specific, you know, if they want to see something specific, like we just brought up pollinators, then we can, you know, guide, we can do some more management guided towards that. Pollinators, for example, are really a big fan of this open grassland uh, prairie habitat. Uh, so in our successional stage, which succession is this broader concept of how land progresses through vegetation types. Um, so our successional stage is our early succession, is, is early on. So it's uh, years zero to 10 post disturbance. Uh, as a grass forb dominated community, forbs are non grassy herbaceous plants. So these are your flowers, uh, stuff like that. Um, there's, as you can see in this graph, there's no structural diversity. We just got a bunch of grasses and flowers and stuff like that. Great if you're a butterfly, not so great if you're a pine marten who wants to hide in some trees. Um, now, if you want, if your landowner wants, you know, to have this kind of uh, community, what you're going to do is you're going to clear kind of any forest there, and um, you're going to go through and you're going to knock out any woody vegetation that tries to come back. 
in the mid-Atlantic, most of our grasslands convert to forest relatively fast because most of this area really wants to become a forest. So it can be tough to maintain these. So you can maintain open grasslands by mowing, by disking, and by prescribed fire. We're going to talk more, more about mowing uh, in a little bit here. So, um, you know, I don't want to spoil that, but we're going to talk a little more about that. All right, give me one more, Luke. Okay, so the next stage of succession is our scrub forest or our young forest. Um, and this is, you know, a forest that's zero to 40 years old. It's got a lot of, you know, small to young trees in there, maybe some shrubby species like elderberry. It's got grasses and forbs. You know, it's got this mix of, you know, some vertical, uh, you know, vertical habitat, but not a ton. You don't have like, you know, 40 foot tall trees. You've got some spaced out trees. So this is a really great habitat for some of, you know, more of our bird species like our warblers, like the golden wing warbler loves habitat like this and it mixed with some open grassland. And, you know, you're gonna create this habitat by doing some clear cutting or, you know, almost a total overstory removal. And then you can either, you know, to accelerate succession, you can plant some trees in there or you can just allow succession to occur. And then if you wanna maintain that, you can do that by brush hogging, by killing into individual stems, just whatever you do to really keep out large trees from invading this area because they will take it over and it'll become a forest really fast if you're not paying attention to it. All right. So then our next stage of succession is our mature forest. So here in the Mid-Atlantic, a mature forest is pretty much anything that's older than 40 years. Uh, you can see some old growth and those are forests that are like going on 400 years old, but it's pretty hard to find those, a uh, true old growth stand in the Mid-Atlantic. So most of the forests that we have are mature hardwood forests. They're like between 100 and 120 years old. This is post clear cut. Uh, sorry, these are from the clear cuts back in like the late 1800s or where a lot of our forests at. So they look kind of like this. You got mature trees, and in the understory, you have limited grass and forb growth, especially in areas with high deer population. So if your animal species wants a mature forest, you're going to create it and maintain it using silviculture. Now, I know silviculture is a whole topic later on, so I'm not even going to delve into that. But it's, I mean, if you want to talk silviculture, we're going to be here for a long time. And now the last stage of succession is my favorite stage, and that's depth. What's important to remember here with succession is at any point you can revert back to death. I know that this seems like a linear process where you go from grassland to forest, but at any time things die. You get something like emerald ash borer that runs through your forest and you went from a mature ash stand to now you have open grassland. So um, while it looks, you know, these dead pines don't look great, you know, kind of look sad, they're actually really great. And you can create them, you know, using double girdling, using herbicides. Um, <clears throat> you want to advance me again, Luke? All right, one more. Okay, another one. Perfect. All right. So um, death is really important in your stand because you get animals like this little brown bat. It's going to hang out in these dead trees and hunt over this open grassland. <clears throat> this also brings up the idea that we, when you're managing for wildlife, it's important to have a diversity of successional stages out there because some wildlife, you know, oh, actually not some, most wildlife use a variety of successional stages. This bat uses dead trees and then it hunts over open grasslands. A lot of grouse will, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, eat in open grasslands and young forests, but they need, you know, dense cover or they need mature forests to find, to drum and to find uh, mates. So it's important to have uh, a diversity of successional habitats in an area. All right, next slide. All right, so now we're going to talk about some unique land features. These are things that don't normally fall into our successional things, like rock, <clears throat> excuse me rock outcroppings, bare rocks, and wetlands. These are all very important and they can be really unique. Um, for example, the green salamander here in southwestern uh, Pennsylvania only lives in um, limestone rock outcroppings. So, you know, when you're going around a property with some landowners, look for these uh, unique landscape features and try to build a plan around them or just think about them in mind. Um, also, you can create some unique landscape features. You know, if they have a wooden fence on their property, if you replace that with a stone fence, you create some great habitat for small mammals and herps. So these are just some small things that you can create that can be really cool for uh, wildlife species and increase your diversity. All right, give me the next one here. Okay, so, oh, 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 there we go. Okay, uh, the animation got a little messed up, it's okay. All right, so now we're gonna talk about wetlands a little bit more. So I'm sure we've all talked about wetlands in the past. Wetlands are really important to almost, you know, most of our wildlife species both as a corridor, so that's how, you know, a lot of animals do migration and get around, but also, you know, species like to live in wetlands. We have this nice pond here, 
Uh, it's got a little buffer around it. Perfect. We want at least a 50 foot buffer. Um, this picture is a little bit far back, but this buffer is about 30 feet of uh, unmown grass. So it's pretty good. Uh, you know, I'd like it to be a little bit larger, but what are you going to do? Um, so, you know, whenever you find a wetland, it's always worth protecting it. All right, Luke, give me a little advance here. We don't want to see a wetland like this, um, where we have, um, uh, this didn't, didn't quite work out, where there's no buffer. And you, so in this wetland, you can't quite see it now, but there, there were cows in the stream here and there's no, there's no buffer at all. We got this wood stacked right in the stream. You know, we don't want to see wetlands like that. That's not a good wetland. It's not good for trout. It's not good for herbs. It's not a good riparian corridor. So we don't want to see that. We want to see, we want to see wetlands like this top one. And it can even be worth creating wetlands depending on where you are. Um, small wetlands can be, <laughs> can be a good uh, attractant for a lot of wildlife species. Uh, I don't really want to recommend you always try to create wetlands, but you know, take a look at the landscape around you. And if there are some vertical ponds or anything like that, you know, make sure and protect those. All right. Okay, so now we're going to talk about stands. So uh, I'm a classically trained forester, and so I kind of just think of the whole world in stands. But you know, I, not, I understand that not everyone you know here is a classically trained forester. So a stand is vegetation composed of similar structure. Now, most people think of a stand, they think of you know just a forest, and they think of a forest that's all the same. Um, and that's you know one way we can do it. It's you know this forest behind us is a similar age, similar size, so it's a hardwood stand. But it can be easier to manage our landscapes when you think about it in stands. All right, Luke, give me a little advance. So here we have our hardwood stand, another one. Then we have our edge. Now this is a stand. So this, you know, we have different management here. In our hardwood stand, we might be doing some thinning, some hinge cutting. Versus our edge here, we're going to do some different mowing regimes. Maybe we won't even mow. Hopefully we won't mow. We might do different planting. And then our lawn, you know, it's a lawn. You're going to manage it like a lawn. So just thinking about your forest in this type, you know, in this way can help you develop, you know, even small management plans. And just like, you know, even if you're just a landowner, you can help you um, kind of um, put your, your management into more of a compartment. You can help you compartmentalize your management and make it more effective. So when you're managing land, just try to think of the stand aspect. All right, Luke, advance me again. So let's look at it uh, on the homeowner side, on a, how a, you know, we look at it in a home. So here we have this home. You know, they got a little lawn, they got a couple of pine trees at back, and they got a couple of acres in the back. So here's our stands. We've got a hardwood stand, we've got a lawn. Oh, we've got a pine stand, and then we have the lawn. So the, here we broke it out into three stands, which will make management easier in the future. All right, now we go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some uh, microhabitats. So we're gonna talk about opening, we're gonna talk about edges, and we're gonna talk about interiors. So here is a forest opening. Um, so openings have unstable temperatures, they have no shade, and they have dry soil. So you're going to get plants that will do very well in openings, like milkweed, that won't do well in the interiors of forest. Um, also, openings are really great for some bird species, like quail and other species. So, you know, again, if you're an owner, if the landowner has specific animals they want to manage for, then you can manage for, for openings in mind. All right, give me the next one here. All right, so here we have uh, a picture of an edge. We get this, you know, power right away. We have, it's not a great edge. We're gonna talk about this edge more in a second, but we get this power right away where they came through and they knocked down all the trees. So we have forest, we have clearing, and then we got a little bit of edge. So the edge is right, you know, you can see where the shade is. It's semi-shady, you've got some plants in there, you've got a little bit drier soil. You know, it's good for deer, uh, animals like that. So you wanna have some edge, you know, if you're going for diversity, you wanna have some edge, you wanna have some opening. And then it's also important to have some interior forest. Perfect. So uh, our interior forests are really great because they have more stable temperatures. You have limited uh, sunlight and you have some more moisture. So animals like martens are going to be found in here. You find different animals in all of these areas and, you know, they uh, use them all differently. Now, when you're, if you're managing an area and you really want to maximize that forest interior, it's best if you try to, you know, use a circle because that way you'll have the least amount of edge possible instead of a square. All right, next. Okay, so I told you we talk more about edges. Here we're talking about edges. Now on the left, we have what we call a hard edge. You see we have trees and then we have grass. Well, I'm sorry, I'm pointing with my mouse. You guys can't see it. Sorry. <laughs> so we have trees and then we have grass. There's no niceness in between. So this is a really tough transition and it's not great if you're, you know, 
a smaller bird or something like that, he would like some kind of gentle transition like you see on the left. On the left here, we have what we call a soft edge. So you can see we have forest, then we have some small trees and tall grass, and the trees are widely spaced. So we, you know, we get all the nice diversity of conditions. So you, with a soft edge, you're gonna see increased diversity and increased use. All right, give me another advance here. All right, another one. Okay, so think of it like this. You know, you can either be taking just a high dive right from that forest, right into that opening, or you can have a nice soft walk down. So if you are, you know, advance. Ah, so imagine you're this, you know, you're this hen turkey with her poults. Which one do you want to do? Do you want to, you know, kind of have that nice little stair step out of the open? Or do you with your little babies want to hard, you know, do a hard dive right into the water? No, no. You're going to want to do that nice little step down. So we you want to try to, you know, have soft edges where you can. All right, give me another advance. So here are some great strategies for improving your edge. So now we're back to our homeowner with the hardwood stand and the little pine stand there along. So let's, you know, let's try to improve this. This is, you know, probably what you're going to see. It's not great for wildlife. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to not mow right up to that forest. We're going to let that grass grow. You know, if you're in an urban area, as tall as you can like grow in the urban area. And if you're not in an urban area, just don't mow it. Don't mow it at all. Then we're going to start to plant some native grasses. Or if you have native grasses there, it's much better to let those grow, to let those run, you know, let your native grasses and forbs grow. You can even put in some small trees and shrubs. You want to make sure you're not planting like, you know, real tall hardwoods in there, because then your edge, you're going to lose your edge, it's going to become a forest. So you want to make sure you widely space those trees out. Also, we want to eliminate straight lines. Nature very rarely does a straight line, and animals don't like it when they do straight lines. They like kind of wavy stuff, so we're going to work in waves or kind of random directions. And then we're also going to have to watch this edge. Edges are a great place for invasive species to show up, so you want to watch those, and you want to get in there and knock any invasives that way you see them. And we're going to talk more about invasives later too. So I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, now let's put it all together. So we went from our, so we, here we got our, our nice edge. So you can see we put in some, we got a wavy pattern in there. We got some shrubs, we got some flowers, we got some native plants. We even threw a little apple tree in there as a little, you know, um, you know, transitional spot between the house. So this is what you would like to see in an area instead of just that, you know, square lawn. And, you know, here's another example of it in practice. As you can see, there's a little raspberry patch up front. There's a little patch of hardwoods in front of the um, main trees. There's also a very pronounced browse line in this picture if you catch it. And that's because this is in uh, an urban area in Milwaukee. There's a ton of deer. We're going to talk deer later too. I'm just transitions on transitions here. All right, next. So I told you we talk about mowing. So we're going to talk mowing. Now, general rule of thumb is where you, you know, where you can't, where you, where you can, don't mow. Because, you know, animals like the tall grass. It's good cover, even when it's dead. So we really want to limit it where we can. All right, next. Instead of mowing, you can use uh, spot spraying with herbicides to control your invasive species. It's much, it's much more effective. Now, if you have to mow, it's really, you really want to avoid mowing April through uh, August, because that summer period is when those plants are growing they're seeding, they're creating all of the great habitat for our wildlife species, and everyone's in there and happy. All right. Now, I understand that, you know, sometimes, it usually doesn't happen with our urban landowners, but our rural landowners, they got to cut hay, they got to feed animals. So if your landowner is going to cut hay, it's best to cut it in, you know, mid to late May, and then let it grow for the rest of the year. And also when they're cutting hay, to leave about a 30-foot perimeter along the edge of that field, so at least those animals have somewhere to hang out and to use, and it's not just a big flat field. All right. Now, if you want to maintain a warm, some warm season grasses, uh, you can mow it, um, you know, August 1st to the 15th. And this will just, you know, help keep down those woody plants and any invaders. Um, but again, we're just going to try to avoid mowing where possible. And then if you want to maintain kind of a cool grass or an open, a cool season grasses or open field to habitat, mow it in September just once or uh, in February or mid-March. Uh, again, this you're just going to mow it just like that to um, keep those woody invaders out. Luke, did you want to talk about the quail for a second? Sure, yeah. Um, I was recently on a tour of some of the last uh, quail habitat on the eastern shore of Maryland and speaking with the biologists there, 
And I uh, also want to note that um, mowing is sort of a last resort for quail uh, habitat. Uh, disking or burning on a rotation. Uh, he does a three-year rotation, so he do thirds uh, annually to keep the uh, keep the trees and the saplings down uh, from turning into a forest, as uh, as Calvin was mentioning, is a best practice if you're looking to, to help facilitate quail populations if you're near some wild populations. Go ahead. Thanks, Lou. All right, let's go to the next slide here. Okay, so now we're talking basics. So here is a paper mulberry, you know, here's paper mulberry. I've seen a bunch of these planted in urban areas as well as, you know, some places for uh, wildlife. And, you know, people think they make a great wildlife tree because they got these big juicy berries, big tall spreading tree, but they're not a good plant for wildlife. They're home to very few native insects, whereas a native oak tree can be home to over 500 species of Lepidoptera. Our native insects rarely use uh, invasive plants, especially invasive trees. Also, birds really use them as cover. I mean, you see it all, I see it all the time, just walking around my neighborhood. You know, I got a bunch of you know, like Japanese maple and a bunch of other plants around here that are just not native. And um, the only bush that I'll hear animals, you know, singing out of is like the native um, yew that's around here, this native Canada yew. I tell you, every time I walk by that thing, it is just chock full of birds. I can hear them singing the whole time. They're not in any of the non-native plants. So we want to eliminate natives, or sorry, eliminate invasives where possible and try to use native plants. All right, Luke, give me an advance here. All right, so now uh, here's another reason why we don't want to use, or what? <laughs> Our native birds also don't see these, you know, invasive plants as a food source. You know, when they fly up to some of our plants, they know what they're looking for. They're looking for a nice juicy steak. Instead, you know, imagine that steak has been replaced with this grilled tofu. This is not what you're looking for if you bird. So you don't even recognize those berries as food. Or our uh, invasives are full of sugar. Give me another advance here. And so they can't really power the birds. You know, a lot of our birds are neotropical migrants. So they're flying from Pennsylvania or Maryland all the way down to the tropics. And when they get all sugared up, they don't have enough energy to make that flight. So we really want to um, make sure we're giving our birds the steak, you know, the good food and the nutrients that they need to make it through. So we want to eliminate invasives and use native plants. Um, so, you know, oh, you're good, perfect. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of herbaceous invasive species. Now, when you're managing invasive species, it can be uh, useful to, you're always going to know what you're looking at without influence your management. So here's Japanese stiltgrass. It's an annual grass. You can control it with herbicides, and then you can also control it with mowing or, or early pulling. You really got to get it before it seeds in June. All right, give me another advance. Here we got some wavy basket grass for our Maryland folks. It's starting to move into Pennsylvania. It's an annual plant. Excuse me. Again, it can be controlled with uh, pulling or mowing, but you really got to get it before it seeds in June. Um, now, a lot of these annual plants you can manage differently than perennial plants because you just got to knock those uh, perennials down a couple of times, or sorry, annuals down a couple of times. Um, and then, you know, you just got to work on getting those seed bank ones out. Uh, for our perennial plants, they take a little bit more work. So grapes here are perennial. And so you gotta, you know, you really gotta put some effort in to kill a grape invasion. Uh, grapes are native, but they've really been taken off recently. So when you deal with some grapes, you wanna spray them in May or September. And if you've got a really big grapevine, cut a window in there and then come back in a year and spray it out. All right, next slide. Okay, man, what kind of talk on invasives wouldn't be complete without multiflora rows, at least in Pennsylvania. So, you know, it is just pervasive here. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're not pulling it at all because those, it'll, when you pull it up, the roots will break off and those fragments can grow new plants. So really, I wanna emphasize chemical control on that plant when you can. And it can take 20 years to get this plant under control in certain areas. Uh, use a foliar spray of herbicides where you can. All right, give me the next one. Uh, this is Japanese barberry. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen it out there. You can control it by hand, but I wouldn't want to try to do that. Uh, foliar sprays of herbicides. We, <clears throat> we found a mix of triclopyr and glyphosate is great for multiflora rows and uh, Japanese barberry. If you go to the Penn State Extension site, it has the entire recipe there uh, on that mix. So, you know, I'm just going to push it right onto that. And uh, Dave Jackson will be talking later. So I'm sure if you have questions on that mix, you can talk to him. 
Uh, bush honeysuckle is another one of these uh, woody invasives. There are about four species of invasive honeysuckles in Pennsylvania. Um, so, but there, there, is, there are two species of native uh, honeysuckles. So make sure you know which one you're looking at. Um, and these can also be controlled with a foliar spray. They don't really respond well to hand cutting because they tend to re-sprout. So you just got to spray them. All right. All right, so let's talk deer. So now we have this beautiful garden here. This is here at the Pennsylvania, or the Penn State Arboretum. Gorgeous garden. And you know what a deer sees? They see a buffet. I'm sure you guys have all seen it out there. The deer come through and they eat everything that you do uh, after you put it in. So the best way to prevent deer from you know, destroying all your hard work is deer removal. You gotta harvest deer. Actually, I just, uh, earlier today, was at a talk about harvesting deer. And if you want to have success, you know, successfully reduce deer population, you gotta harvest around 30% of those antlerless deer a year here in Pennsylvania. So make sure deer harvest where you can is focused on antlerless animals. All right, next. So you can also do some fencing to um, help get those guys out, or keep, to keep the deer out. Um, we found that you can put up a four to six foot fence and that will discourage deer from getting in there. And if there are easier places for them to go, they'll go there. But if you really wanna keep them out, uh, an eight to 10 foot fence is what you need. Next, uh, dogs can be used, but these dogs, dogs have to be present in the area 24 seven. If you leave a dog out in the yard, you know, just to, during the day, the deer are gonna come back at night and they're gonna eat all the flowers at night. Deer are real smart and they got all the time in the world to figure it out. Now we're gonna, now uh, this next slide is gonna be about defensive planting. And I'm a big fan of it. They can really work in some areas as long as you're willing to, you and your, you're, you're willing to think about it and your landowner is okay not having all these big showy plants all the time. All right, now we get a lot of questions about repellents and deterrents, and I find that they have limited effectiveness. Um, deterrents, especially like if it's just a loud sound or a blinking light, deer eventually figure out that it's not really that big of a threat. So when you're using repellents and deterrents, you really have to change those up and you gotta move them around and just limit when you're using them. With the repellents in particular, it's much better to use a smell repellent as compared to a taste repellent. Uh, and that's because, you know, with a taste repellent, they gotta go in there and they gotta eat the plant. So you're still getting some of that limited browns. Okay, now we're gonna talk about how we plant with deer. This is, I, you know, I just learned about this recently, big fan of this idea. So um, when we're planting with deer in mind, this is a cultural control from the deer's perspective. So, you know, what works for some deer may not work for other deer. And that's just because they may have developed different tastes or may like, you know, they, they may like different things and then they grow like other things. So what we're trying to do is to minimize and dissuade damage on our plants and our gardens. So we're gonna do that by planting anti-deer anti plants, you know, especially in that perimeter and on the access points where deer see it. So that way they show up to an area, they look at, they're looking at your area, they look at the yard and they're like, ah, that, that yard doesn't have anything good in there. They're gonna move on to the next yard. So here are some nasty plants, nasty flowers for deer, you know, buttercups, angels, daffodils, milkweeds, we got some nasty shrubs right here. You know, keep, we can keep moving along. All right, but if you need some ground cover, Lily of the Valley are particularly good. They flower nicely and they can really spread out. Um, so some plants you really wanna avoid. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I forget the ones that, um, then we also have plants that uh, bounce back after browse. Um, so these, you know, these plants um, will get browsed, but they, should use, they usually come back pretty well. And then we want to avoid these deer attractors because deer can, you know, they can actually smell these plants and they come to a yard just because they smell these plants. We want to avoid daylilies, hostas, tulips, and even apple trees. I know it's hard to say. Um, now there are a bunch of different deer lists, you know, lists about there about what you can plant in an area. So I would really check that because, you know, different states, you know, different, uh, you can plant different things in different states. So really check your local lists. And also uh, Dr. Anderson from the um, EPA has a great article about it. So check that one out. All right, so now when we're thinking about managing, you know, we're thinking about trying to protect our garden, I like to think about it defensively, you know, like I'm an old school general. So we got our garden here in the middle and we wanna keep the deer invaders away. All right, we had advance. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do some population reduction. We're gonna do some hunting, if you can. Then we're gonna do some strategic planning. We're gonna, you know, make the yard look not good for the deer. You're gonna cut down that invasion. And the last thing we're gonna do if you need it, is we're gonna put some fencing up. And then you got a safe garden because you stopped all the invaders. 
All right, so, so we, we got that in theory, but here's what it looks like in reality. So now we, here's our yard. A client has hired you because they keep having problems with deer eating their daylilies and getting into their garden. So the first thing we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out those daylilies up front because those are just attracted to deer. We're gonna drop in some native conifers because those aren't tasty to deer. We're gonna put in some native flowers. We're gonna put in some nasty bushes and it's not gonna look good for deer. Then after that, we're gonna put up our second wall of defenses. We're gonna put up our resilient plants that come back after browse. We're gonna put up some nasty um, hedges uh, in front of our garden, plant some more flowers around that garden. Then we're gonna put the garden back and this time we're gonna put a small four foot fence around it. And then around the apple tree, which is also attack, attracting deer, we put up some nasty plants that the deer didn't like, so they're not gonna come back. And now we have a yard that's pretty deer proof. And also if you're you know, a landscaper, you have a lot of work to do here. So it's a win-win. All right, next. So now this is, uh, we're gonna talk about hinge cutting a little bit. Hinge cutting is for larger woodland properties. Um, when you hinge cut, the goal is to provide some low cover for animals like rabbits and birds, and also to provide food for deer and other herbivores. So which, uh, what a good stand to do this in is a stand that's really dense or on trees that are low value or low quality trees, you know, like ironwood or some real beat up um, hardwoods. So, um, I don't really recommend hinge cutting trees that are bigger than eight inches in diameter. Uh, and that's because those trees, they, you know, it gets really dangerous to hinge cut large trees and they also might not take. What happens when you're hinge cutting is you're gonna try to knock both the tree over but keep some of that bark intact, that cambium where the uh, sap flows. And that way you can get some live growth. So if you got a small, so if it's a small tree, what you're gonna do is you're gonna bend it over, you just thwack it a couple times with a hatchet and it's gonna snap off and you're gonna, make sure it's pushed down towards the ground. The tree's gonna keep throwing up branches like you can see here, but it's gonna be knocked down. So this is, you know, nice, nice if you're a bird and stuff. Uh, and when you're doing this in small trees, you know, make small cuts, it'll be easier. You can use a chainsaw on larger trees, but really watch out the trees that you're doing it on. Now the National Deer Association has a great video and a great guide on this. And I really recommend you check that before you get into hinge cutting large trees. Also, if you find yourself doing a lot of hinge cutting, you may wanna step back and think like, do I need to do all this hinge cutting? Should I be doing something different? Maybe I should be actually like cutting some of these trees down for firewood, or maybe even if possible, thinking about a timber sale. So, you know, it's a good practice, but you don't want to use it too much. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot though. <laughs> I got the snags. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about snags real quick. Um, snags are dead, dead standing trees. Um, they are home to a bunch of different animals and insects. They're a great home for all kinds of insects. Uh, you know, they, thousands of different animals will use a snag through its life, uh, through its life, life cycle as a tree or as a snag. So you want to maintain as many as you can in a landscape. Uh, you know, there's no mac, you know, there's no too high end of the amount of snags you want to aim for, but it can be hard to keep up. Um, it can be hard to keep snags in your forest, you know, just because we tend to have mature forest now. They're not really towards that death stage. So you wanna aim for about five, at least five snags an acre where possible. Um, and if you don't have any snags in an acre, you can just girdle some trees or inject them with herbicide to create new snags. Um, now, obviously it can be dangerous in areas to have standing snags or standing dead trees. So if you can't you know, have a full dead tree around, what you can do is have those trees top and at least maintain some of that trunk and then you'll get some benefit out of having, you know, dead trees around and having that uh, dead standing wood. All right, so I'm gonna take a take the reins from Calvin. Thank you, Calvin, for covering all that. Um, a lot of good material in there. Um, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about animal population management and get into um, some of the basic issues with actually managing the populations themselves of the animals. So one of the main concepts to think about is carrying capacity. Um, this is this figure is an idealized image of how populations grow and then max out at care, what we call carrying capacity, which is the maximum population uh, size that an area can sustain. There are four main factors to think about when you're thinking about wildlife populations, birth, death, immigration population coming in and emigration population going out. Now that 
previous slide was the stylized mathematical formula for what that looks like. But in reality, oftentimes species can grow beyond their carrying capacity and in and, and something they call overshoot the carrying capacity and be in a situation where they can actually uh, cause damage or eat out um, what they eat out um, the food resources they need and actually then crash afterwards. Um, so uh, different types of wildlife species have different types of population growth patterns. Um, some, um, as on this uh, figure on the right, um, the red line is uh, characterizes these boom and bust cycles where populations rise quickly and then crash. And those are called R selected species. Um, small mammals like rabbits, mice um, are characteristic of this where they will, you might see a lot one year and then they might seem all gone the following year. Whereas there are also more equilibrium oriented species that don't have as fast of growth rate and don't tend to have as dramatic shifts. Those are tend to be called, those are called case selected species. So I uh, wanted to follow up on uh, Calvin, when Calvin mentioned the harvest issue and the deer overpopulation issues. Um, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, what I'll say is make sure you follow your local hunting laws. You'll need to get, if you want to do it yourself, um, you'll need to get hunter education and get a hunting license. I will say uh, there are lots, I've never met a landowner who, who was in want of hunters if they asked around or advertised at all. Um, even though hunter populations are declining, um, I usually most landowners I've spoken with have not had a problem finding hunters if you need help with that. Um, I also, uh, elevated stands are a good way to increase success. Um, I do want to note they, are, they, they provide a lot of safety in terms of the shots going downward um, in a place that might be a suburban or exurban area. However, there are increased risks, risks of falling. Make sure your hunters use safety harnesses, inspect their stands and follow the instructions on the, on the stands they get. Um, there are also a variety of deer damage programs that allow people um, to have more, uh, more lenient or ways to harvest um, deer if, if uh, crop damage or other aspects are a problem for larger landowners. Um, when we talked about snags, when Calvin mentioned snags earlier, um, he said oftentimes people might need to remove snags and old dead trees because of the risks of falling branches and, and limbs. Um, so in the cases where you might have had to remove snags and you find you feel that there's a, that's a limiting factor for cavity nesting birds, um, there are a variety of options for creating artificial cavity nests that have helped wood duck populations, bluebirds, wrens, and others. Um, but I want to emphasize the importance of using a predator guard with these boxes. Um, they can actually be a population sink because snakes and other predators have actually keyed in and quickly learned to associate these boxes with an, uh, a quick and easy meal. So um, it's, uh, it can be actually detrimental to put these out without predator guards. Um, and then I'll wrap up quickly. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna speed through these last few slides, but also just wanna think about habitat loss and human disturbance. On this landscape, we see there's a lot of subdivisions and land use change is, continues to be one of the big factors um, affecting wildlife populations. So if, you're, if your landowners are thinking about structures, roads, and other aspects, they might, be, might, might wanna think about the impact of any additional uh, structures on, on the larger landscape. Um, it further fragments the population, as well as artificial light and noise factors. Um, conservation easements are uh, an avenue in which people can voluntarily um, give up or extinguish the development rights so that their property won't be further developed in the future if they own a larger parcel. Uh, waters and wetlands. Um, want to note also that um, amphibians especially are prone to being hurt by over fertilization or uses of pesticides um, not following the labels. So make sure you follow the labels. Get a soil test if you're going to put apply foil, apply fertilizer so you don't over apply. You can save yourself money by not applying too much. So um, Penn State has a good soil testing program and they will send you recommendations for how much you will need. Um, birds, domestic cats, windows are also things to think about. Uh, keep your domestic cats indoors. Um, there are a variety of ways if you have birds that do, thousands of birds hit windows every year and are, are killed. Um, there are a variety of methods to keep your windows um, from becoming a bird problem. 
lighting and noise is also an issue. And I'm going to move through these pretty quickly because we're running out of time. But uh, just uh, the big three, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation has some good recommendations here. Keep it low, uh, keep the lights low to the ground. Long wavelength um, lights are better than uh, brighter lights and keep it shielded and aiming down to reduce lighting impacts on wildlife. So to conclude, um, uh, I think one of the big things I think is important is to learn about the wildlife species that you're, that you're interested in, learn about what's on your property and what it can support. Um, learn about the plants, learn how to manage them. Think about your landscape, the scale that you're working with and succession, how the landscape changes over time. And finally, think about some of the human impacts that we might um, be able to avoid um, in the future. So with that, I'll stop and say thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Calvin, and thank you, Luke. Uh, I want to uh, uh, go back and share my screen for a second here. Yeah, let me unshare my screen. Thank you. Okay, and there's uh, the, the contact information for both Calvin and Luke there in case uh, you didn't catch it in just a second. And I want to uh, make a quick apology uh, at the start here. My internet dropped out just as Calvin was talking about deer. So I missed out on some of the, some of the expert advice. So I'm gonna have to go back and take, uh, take another look to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And when that happened, uh, I lost all of the the questions and answers that that were uh, that were pending. Uh, I know Julianne wanted to answer one live, so I'm hoping that she could remember what that was and she could address it. The question is, what kind of ratio do you recommend between hardwood to edge footprint? And I see, it looks like Calvin is typing an answer right yeah. now. But it would be nice to have that answered for yeah. everybody. Well, I, I think Jonathan might answer this in the chat real quick, but there's not, for, there's not one hard and fast rule on, uh, you know, edges. It kind of, it depends a little bit on the property and the uh, species you want. But I would say you want at least like a 20 foot edge. Um, again, you know, it's if you have room, but any edge is better than no, any soft edge is better than no soft edge. And you need, you could even go up to 40 feet, uh, 40, 50 feet, you know, if, if there's the property, it really depends. It's, it's not really a hard and fast rule. I would say 20 to 40 feet is a good, you know, it's a good zone in there, but um, it, it can be tough, you know, if you're on a small property or if you're, you know, in a more urban area, but any, anything is better than nothing. You know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Okay, we also have a question from Liz. Any recommendations for managing feral cats? Okay, well, I'll say it because it's, it's, no one really wants to say it, but um, you, the only sure solution to feral cats is um, removal, it's lethal control. Um, the feed, you know, the colony things where you feed them and then they try to do birth control, those don't really work. The, the research has come back time and time again, those don't work. Um, and even, if you're able to uh, give all the cats birth control, they'll still kill some. The only for sure thing is lethal control or adoption if possible, but it's really hard to adopt out feral cats. Uh, and that's really hard to get places to do. Um, and my cat is usually around, she was around earlier. Um, I, you know, I say that as a cat lover, you've got to do lethal control or, and definitely make sure people are keeping their cats inside. And I would add to that, ask your uh, ask your veterinarian because our veterinarian is is uh, involved with a number of colonies in the Gettysburg, Pennsylvania area, and she's working with the local humane society there to deal with uh, a feral cat population in some of the local farms. So find out from your local vet. Uh, they have they're they're always interested in, in talking with folks about uh, maintaining cat population health uh, because feral cats are different from 
wild dogs, you don't hear about problems with wild dogs, but you do about wild cats. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a problem and uh, there's a lot of good expert advice out there. That's my two cents. Okay, um, Mary has a question. For properties that are surrounded by agricultural fields, how much forest density and edge area is needed to attract diverse types of wildlife? Again, I'll, I can try to take a stab at this one. I think that really is a very difficult question to answer because there's so, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, some species, as you have greater amounts of forest, you'll start, if you have a thousand acres of forest surrounded by agricultural fields, you'll have some really interesting woodpecker and forest interior bird species. If you have a small um, area of uh, woods, it might be more um, it's just more inviting to uh, more edge type species. So it's um, very hard like uh, black phoebes and a variety of birds, but there's so many, there are hundreds of birds um, and it's very hard to, to say, to give an answer to that. It really depends. And even the diversity question, it's very, I don't know if I could say a number for that, but um, I would say certainly the edge habitat does tend to have more, um, higher biodiversity because you have two types of habitats interacting. But the larger it is, the more you will have new types of species come in in these larger, um, the larger tracks. So it's, um, again, hard to say, but certainly some edge will generally kind of bring in some more species than none. Um, I would try to maximize the forest that edge if you can. Uh, you don't really need to worry about, you know, early succession communities because if you're already surrounded by that, so really, really focus what you can you know, focus on. If you have some good forest and some good edge, maximize that. Uh, and just, you know, you got the, you're surrounded by the early successional community. So you, you have a nice edge in, you get that 40 to 50 foot edge in. And then, you know, if you can forest, make sure the rest of that uh, property is a good forest and you really have that perfect ma the matrix that we're all looking for. So I see, should I go ahead with the next question, Andrew? Is that all right? Sure, go ahead. So I, I see the question. We live in a suburban area with lots of woods, a cluster development. We have a wildlife skunks, box turtles, fox, raccoons, deer. In this condition, how do we keep? How could we keep the wildlife from becoming a nu nuisance? Um, one of the important aspects is the uh, removal of any attractants, especially with things like raccoons and skunks. Um, keeping your trash in your garage. Um, keeping it, the lids on in the appropriate way. There's a variety of different ways to manage that, but managing any attractants that might be bringing them in that would cause um, damage. Um, beyond that, uh, it depends on how, on, on the types of, um, I guess, your tolerance for, for wildlife and how much you want them versus wanting to get rid of them. After uh, if, if there is a, a particular problem like burrowing near your house or under your house, uh, um, then um, trapping and use Maryland has specific laws about what can be trapped and what's the final disposition of it. But usually if it's trapped, it needs to be uh, euthanized there. It could be released on the same site, but that will not solve the problem. But it usually involves trapping and euthanization for other species. Okay, Anthony asks, do swaps apply only to state land, park reserves, or do they cover farms, for example? Do Maryland and Pennsylvania prohibit any plants, trees, et cetera, as some states do? I mentioned the swaps and brought them up. Uh, I believe they cover the entire state. So they're designed to cover federal, state, private land. It, it describes a state of wildlife for the whole state. So, um, and they talk about the different habitats and we'll, usually we'll talk about state versus private lands and different types of habitats that might be owned or might not be in federal land. So, um, and there's another part, do they, does Maryland and Pennsylvania prohibit any plants, trees, as some other states do? I am not as much an expert. I think, I don't know if they ban them outright. There has been discussion I've been seeing about that, but I'm um, not aware there, of any species ban. Go ahead, Calvin. There is an invasive, uh, or a, nu it's a nuisance weed list, or I can't remember if it's a nuisance weed list, but there's a weed list and uh, you can't have plants on the weed list. That list is pretty small. Um, most of the plants on there are not ones that we, ah, thank you. It's a noxious weed list. Um, most of the plants on there are, are not really plants that most people would think about having anyways. Um, and, and, 
Yeah, go ahead, Kelvin. Oh, I was just gonna say I, you couldn't, you can't really get those over the counter anyways because you know they're not just weed list. So, kind of solves that problem. <laughs> And, and one of the things uh, I would also recommend is going to the State Department of Agriculture because they often have lists like that of, of noxious weeds, of, of uh, controlled uh, species. Uh, what's interesting is that something that uh, researchers are beginning to recognize as a problem like Japanese barberry is still available for a number, from a number of landscapers. Uh, because they say it makes great habitat, and now they're discovering the the uh, connection between habitat for white mice, which of course attract deer ticks, which of course have Lyme disease, and so you have to be very careful, especially when you're dealing with landscaping. Oh yeah, I can't say enough about how bad uh, Japanese barberry is for Lyme disease. That's it. Um, I think it ups the ticks and the property by something like 400%. So just knocking that back really reduces tick load. So of course, the, the key there is to attract opossums because we know they are great consumers of ticks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, do you have anything good to say about beavers? They inhabit the natural flow of wetlands, inhibit, excuse me, inhibit the natural flow of wetlands to larger bodies of water and backing up to upland trees. Any suggestions? I, I'm sure Calvin does too. I, I've got a beavers in my backyard occasionally and we have, so we have a creek that runs through. I actually, uh, they, will, they will girdle trees, they will kill some trees. Um, I actually think that they're an interesting component of the wetland ecosystem. Um, I can understand wanting to have um, drier areas, um, but they do create ponds that create a lot of habitat for other types of wildlife like waterfowl, wood duck habitat. Um, and you mentioned how they do impede the flow of, what, of water to larger bodies. That, that's true, um, but generally slower moving water, it tends to be cleaner water. It becomes the sediments filter out through those dams and it ends up being cleaner by the time it gets out to those larger water bodies. Um, I like I like beavers, although I, I, I do recognize that they can create very large dams and, and make what was ground into a lake. Um, so, um, but that's my thoughts. Calvin, do you have anything on that one? Yeah, yeah no, you're, you're super on everything. I just want to take, I'm going to be real specific. Uh, there was just the natural flow of wetlands uh, is what I'm going to be really specific about. Uh, beavers are part of the natural system. Um, we just need to make sure that we're going back to our time scale thinking here, you know, wetlands move and they change shape and, you know, they're not always going to be the wetland that, you know, maybe you bought your property with or like maybe it had been for five or six years. Um, so like, you know, that, nat that change is part of nature. It's part of being natural. They don't inhibit natural flows of wetlands. You know, that disturbance is nature in action. But if you're having problems with beavers, I did just drop in the chat, um, wildlifehelp.org. It's a great site from uh, a couple of collaborating uh, state agencies. So check that out. They got a bunch of stuff um, about you know, dealing with nuisance wildlife. And uh, there is a whole nother uh, webinar on dealing with nuisance wildlife. So, And if you want to preserve week. particular trees, like large trees or specimens that you don't want to have girdled, you, there is three by five mesh fencing around the tree. If you can get it around it and have it about a foot off, have it down to the ground, um, that's shown to be pretty effective in, from what my, on my experience so far. Although I have to uh, share a story when I lived along the Missouri River in Montana, uh, the, the beaver there just climbed right up them and took out the cottonwoods. They, they just ignored it, just climbed over. Over them. the mesh? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, they, they just started their, their chewing a little higher up. I don't know if they're that talented here. Okay, uh, Larissa asks, curious to know, is the Homeowner's Guide to Protecting Frogs, Lawn, and Garden Care available for review? Yeah, it's it's on the on the web. Um, if you haven't gotten on Google yet and typed it in, uh, it's I think Virginia actually hosts the the document, and I can I can pull it up right now. Maybe popped in the chat window. 
Okay, thank you. While we're doing that, uh, we'll go on to Byron and Jean who say, how can we develop warm season meadows given abundant bittersweet, honeysuckle, and multiflora rose on our property? Uh, well, well, Luke's taken uh, doing that type. I'll, I'll try to try answer this as best I can. Um, so it's going to take some time. That's for dang sure. Um, you know, what you want to do is you, if you have a designated area, if you have an area in mind or something that's already you're kind of working on, you know, this is a long-term process, you know, controlling multiple rows can take 20 years. So you want to just eliminate pockets and just, you know, work towards success. You kind of want to triage an area. You want to um, establish, you know, sites or pockets of natives if they're not already in an area. Like if you got like an area that's just all invasives, you know, I would try to establish a small pocket of natives and just start working out from there. But if you have, you know, like a more established warm grass area that's getting invaded, then just kind of slowly start working, you know, start from the interior and work out on uh, just eliminating those invasives. But basically, you know, it's just a matter of time and just keep working on it. Um, also, you're probably never going to totally eliminate any of these um, invasive species. You know, if you could just get them down to a point that your native population is still going to be in there and it's going to be successful, like that's the best that you can probably do. Um, you know, don't let perfect, again, don't let perfect be, a, be the enemy of good. Try to knock those invasives down and get them to a point where that area is functional and it's working. So like, that's what I recommend. You know, just start spraying just start slowly working an area and just keep working it. And, you know, after you work on something for a while, you, you might only have to come back once a year to just spray up any, just spray down any new uh, invasives. Um, also, if you can, prescribed fire can be really great to help you uh, get these warm, warm season uh, areas, you know, installed. Prescribed, doing prescribed fire in Pennsylvania is pretty tough. I mean, can't speak to uh, Virginia and Maryland as much. But definitely work with professionals before you try to light anything on fire. Okay, Luke, did you have anything to add to that? Um, prescribed fire, I think, is actually, I've heard relatively good things about the ease of doing it in Maryland. I've not conducted one myself in Maryland, but um, I think it's possible. I think there's, you have to work with the Maryland Forest Service and uh, come up with a plan. But uh, as Calvin mentioned, do be careful. Um, uh, it can it can get catastrophic risks, so please be aware of the potential risk for escape. Okay, next question: How wide a forest, and they put that in quotes, is necessary to enable sustainment? I'm in a two-acre minimum area that is mostly semi-mature forest, but with lots of lawns and driveways to go with the homes. How can forests be sustained in suburban environments? Well, uh, so in this case, you're not really, um, you know, you have a, it, anything that's over an acre and it's mainly woody is a forest. So you, we can take those air quotes right out, but we got forests um, and you don't really need, you know, a maximum, a minimum size to be sustained. When you're working with a smaller property like this, it's really nice because you can really just focus your effort on a couple of trees and some openings. So if you have a mature established forest and there's not a lot of light getting into the understory, um, you know, there's not a lot you can do because the lights, the light's not there for it. So what you do in that case is just enjoy it. But if it's, you know, kind of, if it's semi-shady and you're starting to see, there's starting to be some gaps in the canopy and you didn't light the understory, um, what you can do there is to, you know, really try to help encourage any native seedlings that are on, any native seedlings and saplings that are on the ground. So usually in um, our urban forest, we'll see like a lot of oaks coming up and they get browsed by deer and then knocked back down. So if there's a little patch, you know, if there's a little gap opening, put up a little uh, four foot fence, you know, if you, you know, four foot minimum, uh, we've seen success with a four foot fence to kind of keep some deer out. But if you can put up a little eight foot fence, you can do that. Um, but with these like little small pockets of woodlands, just really keeping those invasives out uh, and the deer pressure down will do a number on it. And these forests really want to stay forest. You know, it's hard to keep, uh, an area not forested in Pennsylvania. Also, uh, try to limit compaction in any of these areas. That is, a, that is another reason why we see forests fail to reestablish. So, you know, just make sure no one's driving over any everything we don't have to with a steamroller or something like that. Uh, 
Okay, we still have some time. I think we've answered all of the questions that are in the Q&A right now. And there's been some excellent discussion going on back and forth in the, in the chat box, a number of very, uh, very interesting links uh, for documents um, about, um, about the things that have been discussed. Okay, we do have another question. Uh, Cheryl asks, would it be better to spray herbicide or burn a grass field before planting warm season grasses? Um, I, I'm not yet much of an expert in Maryland uh, grassland restoration yet, but I, uh, when I was recently out, um, I've been out with a couple of folks and they actually found that the seed bank was sufficient to bring back a lot of um, native grasses were already there. They were surprised how well the seed bank remained. So you might be able to uh, just manage the grass field and watch and keep your natives and try and manage for your invasives or non-natives. Um, but I think it would also depend on the timing and this particular weeds you have, um, like that came across earlier with the say stilt grass, you wouldn't probably have in a grassland environment, but there are certain weeds that have produced seed at a certain time. So, uh, burning or, um, spraying right before that would, is oftentimes an approach that's used. So, uh, and it wouldn't matter in that case, as long as you got it uh, before the seed set. Actually, herbicide, you'd probably want to do earlier in the spring, so they, uh, um, following the labels, uh, but it, it really depends on the on the species you've got. Um, Calvin, are you, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I got, I got a couple of thoughts, because this is actually what I worked my master's on. So uh, in this picture, I'm holding up some Chinese tallow that re after a burn. So uh, in this case, it's probably a yes and. Uh, prescribed fire is great, knocks back a lot of our invasives and really good for our native species. Uh, but some invasives do respond positively to prescribed fire, like the patch of uh, invasives you can see that I'm holding on to. We were trying to burn out the invasives and it totally failed. My master's was a failure, I'm gonna be very honest. But you know, failure is what you need to, what you need to know to, to learn and to grow. So um, you know, it's important to know your invasives and what you got, because you might have to go out and spray those invasives before you burn or uh, do some spot spraying after you burn. But if you can, I would definitely recommend a burn. I'm never going to not say burn, you know, as long as you get professionals and it's within your state rules and regs. Uh, burning is just great for a lot of grasses and insects and all kinds of stuff. But you may have to follow up or you may have to follow up with some uh, herbicide application or preempt your burn with some herbicide application uh, in case you get any invasives that like fire or fire doesn't kill. So it's a yes and in this case. Yeah, and, and she added a little detail saying this is in Virginia near the Shenandoah River and it was in corn not long ago. Yeah, if it, especially if it was in corn, if it was, you know, if it has not, doesn't really have a fuel built up, then you might need to spray for a little while and then do, then burn. Um, you know, it, it, it's just like Luke said, it, it can, it's really tricky, you know, without being on the ground looking at it. So if there's not a fuel bed built up, you might, may have to wait a little bit, you know, do some spraying and then wait for your fuel to build up and then burn. Okay, uh, this is for, for both of you folks. How might you go, ahead, go about selling wildlife practices to a client? Say you've got someone who's, who you're, you're working with as a you know, business person and they're saying, we wanna get some more out of our land. And they say, we wanna attract wildlife. How would you go about selling your services, your practices, I should say? To a homeowner that was wanting to increase wildlife? Yes. Well, I've got the, the best parts done because they already want wildlife. So, um, but I think, um, I think having um, knowledge of, uh, okay, I, I, I get where you're going with this. Thank you, Andrew. I had to take a moment to think about it. Um, I think showing knowledge of the species, of the invasive plants, of the variety of native or invasive plant species, um, demonstrating that to a homeowner, demonstrating knowledge of the nuance of improving habitat. For example, with the nest boxes, making sure predator guards are in place. Um, with uh, fertilizer applications that you do a soil test in advance, um, knowledgeable aspects of testing before application. Uh, for any pesticides or herbicides used showing and making sure, demonstrating to the landowner that, yes, 
we can't this will our scheduling will depend on the weather because we cannot spray the day before the rains um, because that the labels require at least 24 hours for these herbicides or pesticides to dry so that they don't end up in the waterways and and cause problems for for frogs or fish life so those are a few things I that came off the top of my head Okay, we've got a couple of people who have raised their hands. So uh, we're going to allow uh, Patricia to talk first. I think she has a question. So go ahead, Patricia. Go ahead and unmute and uh, share what you have to say. I really didn't have a question. I, I was just, I guess I pressed something that, um, I shouldn't have. So oh, I don't. Okay. I was just listening. <laughs> not, not a problem. I thought you might. I, already, I thought you might have an involved question that you didn't feel like typing. Oh, I guess I pressed something that I shouldn't have done. But not a problem. I, I've been listening to what you. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we do have a couple of other questions. Uh, Russ says pollinators and pollinator habitat improvement seems to be one of the easiest ways to engage young people in wildlife management. Do you think it would be appropriate to place commercial wildlife species lower on the list of examples when trying to describe society's ideas of what wildlife is? Commercial wildlife species? Oh, I think maybe he means um more charismatic wildlife species perhaps maybe game or or i mean is you you are in maryland you know could be a crab question <laughs> true um absolutely i think there's a room there's definitely room for pollinators on um in a, a talk like this and uh as i mentioned i think a lot of people traditionally think of wildlife as terrestrial vertebrates um, but certainly uh, invertebrates count in there. And uh, I'm actually planning a talk next week for a master gardeners group to talk about wildlife and, uh, and gardens. So uh, definitely, there's definitely a lot of interest and um, I think we'll be, I'm sure we will be addressing that in future topics. Uh, Russ seems to have clarified, he, he meant game species. Game species, okay. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think Russ said you're not wrong. I think that, uh, Pollinators are a great way to talk to people about wildlife management and just, just get the foot in the door. Non-game species are also that way. Uh, we're seeing more and more with um, wildlife students um, that they're, they're more interested in non-game species and like, you know, the not, not traditionally what we think of um, when we're thinking a lot of us, you know, wildlife management, we you know, usually think, you know, deer, you're thinking squirrel, all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, you gotta hit everyone where everyone's got different paths, so hit them where you can, you know. Sometimes it's non-game species, sometimes it's herbs. Sometimes, Maryland, you got crabs. It's, you know, maybe you want to talk about crabs and that, how you, you know, you can just start to reel people in on this whole wildlife management thing. So I, I like to hit all the buttons that I can. Thank you. Uh, Cynthia wants to know, what are your thoughts on tree planting and the periodic cicadas soon to arrive? I assume she means the 17-year cicadas that are coming out or expected to come out this, this coming year. I'm going to defer to our resident forester. Oh yeah. How many uh, thoughts yeah. on this one? Yeah, I would be too concerned about it. Yeah, if you're gonna, I mean, I, I haven't really heard of many, if any trees being lost to cicadas, there, there are a lot more pressing uh, animals that'll get to them, you know, be it uh, voles or rabbits or deer. So I think that if you're gonna lose trees, it's probably gonna to be to one of those guys rather than to a cicada. They, I mean, if you get some really heavy cicada in there, they can do some damage, but trees usually recover pretty fast from it. So I wouldn't be too worried about it. Just make sure you, to put some tree tubes down when you're planting to keep those um, herbivores out of them. Yeah, I lived through the 17 year cicadas not this most recent one, but back in the 80s in suburban DC, and the birds loved them. The birds just had a grand old time with them. They didn't seem to worry about anything else and just chomping on them, and it was a grand old time for them. Okay, another question. 
Are there any benefits to groundhogs? They seem very destructive, but I'm trying to be open-minded. Well, I'll throw out a couple of things. One is they're, they're very curious to watch and fun, curious, interesting little creatures. Um, there's, a name, there's a whole day named after them. But uh, no, and seriously, um, uh, you could think of soil aeration as a potential benefit. You have uh, tunnels going into the soil. Um, and perhaps they have young, uh, as long as they're away from your house foundation or any foundations, um, their young might attract uh, other predators, depending on if you're interested in seeing foxes around, you know, you might have some other, um, other species show up looking for an easy meal. Um, but um, those are a couple of ideas. Also, those abandoned burrows I, I see is popping off in the chat right now, but those abandoned burrows from uh, groundhogs are really great habitat for uh, herpetiles. Uh, I did some, some snake work in a former life, and we find a lot of rattlesnakes hanging, uh, hanging out and giving birth in those abandoned burrows. Um, it's, it's cool to see, but not when you have to count the snakes, because uh, then you got to figure out how to get the rattlesnakes out of the groundhog burrow, and that that's not fun. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, around the I, I, my fiance and I are huge fans of watching the groundhogs because I just think they're so funky when they run. You know, they're just kind of like, kind of, they're just kind of like chubby and they're just really funny. So just, you know, I'm a huge fan of the groundhog. I'm not going to lie. Huge fan. And I think hey, also I, foxes will use their burrows as well afterwards, I believe. So oh, you could yeah. find that something else comes in into their burrows afterwards. Yeah, I think we get, uh, get an impression of groundhogs from Punxsutawney Phil and that's all but they are definitely uh, an interesting part of the ecosystem. It looks like Anna shared a publication from Maryland Extension about the potential for uh, young trees dying in, in, with the cicada um, cycles. So uh, she has a, she sent, shared a link. Yeah, that'll be from the Home and Garden Information Center. Yeah. Um, for folks here in Pennsylvania, we are also projected to have a pretty bad year for gypsy moth next year. They were just presenting at the forest health meeting here in Pennsylvania. So, do you mean 21 like next, or, Calvin, do you mean 21 or 22? 21, 21. 21. Okay. So it looks like uh, next year might be a rough year for some trees. Okay, Anna says they are recommending to hold off planting until the cicadas are gone or net them with one centimeter mesh. All right, I guess, I guess then we will refer to the article then. I, I take it back, I take it back. Anna was right. Okay, and reminds us that they are not the, uh, the brood X periodical cicadas, uh, the 17 year ones are not the same as the annual, annual dog day cicadas. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, there are three year cicadas, there are seven year cicadas, there are 17 year cicadas. There's a, a variety of, of different ones um, that, uh, that come out periodically and they don't all come out at once, which is an interesting quirk of nature. How about that? Well, you know, I, I always got to refer to my experts here. So if the experts wrote the article, then you know what? Anna's right. We've got to refer to the experts on this one. Oh, there was a question in the chat about woodchucks and groundhogs. Yeah, they're the same thing. It's just common names are different. Uh, I think out west, they also call them whistle pigs is what I, is, is another word for them or another name for them. It's kind of like cougars and panthers, or sorry, cougars, or mountain lions, or pumas, our catamounts, or it just, who <laughs> said like 17, at least 17 recognized names. And then the debate is, are they in your state? Uh, oh, I, I, I want them to be in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I'd be so fun. Oh, someone, someone does call them whistle pigs. All right. Okay, let's see. Uh, Jenny wants to know in what month will the cicadas emerge? Early well, May, been... early May. Thanks, Luke. I've already been burned on cicadas once, so I wasn't going <laughs> to take it. Give or take probably a couple weeks. Yeah, a lot of it depends on the weather. If, if you get a really, really warm spring, they'll be out sooner. If it's a wetter, cooler spring, they may not come out until, until June. At least that's my memory of it. Uh, I see in the chat there's some, some stuff going on about pesticides. Um, the Penn State Extension site has a really great mix 
for controlling most of our uh, invasive woody invasive plants. And it even works on some of the grass plants. Uh, I'll put a link in there in a second. Just make sure that you're following all label directions and um, make sure that when you're spraying pesticides, uh, you check with your state to see if you need to have an applicator's license before you go out there and spray. Uh, and I'm also gonna plug some Penn State Extension stuff. We have a lot of great educational material on spraying pesticides. So if you're new to pesticides, just don't, don't go to the store and just buy stuff off the shelf. Take some classes first, learn how to do it, mix it up, and then go spray it. And join us for later webinars in this series because we'll be having a, a week on that that's uh, coming up later on. So we are, I think we have just about answered all the questions that are in the Q&A. Um, so since we are now just at 830, what I want to do is uh, thank Calvin and Luke for joining us tonight. Uh, make sure you, you write down their emails there in case another question comes up and you can contact them. But before I let everyone go, I want to remind you what's going on on Thursday. The next uh, Next session, if I can get my slides to advance here. They don't want to advance. How about that? There we go. Uh, Thursday night, same time, 7 to 8.30, we'll be dealing with uninvited guests addressing wildlife conflicts to wind up wildlife week. And so I want to thank Luke and Calvin again. I want to thank everybody for the wonderful questions and the participation in the chat room. Uh, the folks from the Woods New Backyard Partnership have been expressing a lot of great uh, information, sharing it with all of us. So we want to thank them as well. So on behalf of Luke and Calvin and Agnes and myself and Julianne and Jonathan and Joe and Adam and everyone in the chat box, I want to thank you all for joining us. We will see you back here Thursday, same time. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening. See you then. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.